Hi everyone and welcome to Pride Inside. My name is Sen Raj and I'm a part of Amnesty International UK's Rainbow Network. So it's a real pleasure tonight to be able to bring to you this session. We're going to be talking about OK Nazilu's new book, The Private Joys of Nena Maloney, and during a time where we're spending a lot of time indoors and we're reconnecting with fiction, with popular culture. What better way to find pride than by reading fiction by queer writers that speak to our communities and to our intimacies? And without any further ado, I would like to introduce my guest tonight, or rather today. Uh, OK, uh, Nazilu, uh, please join us. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to, well, I was going to say it's so nice to be here, but I'm, I'm in my living room, which is where I have been for the yes. past three months. But it's nice to be online with you. And it is an absolute pleasure. Now, for those who aren't aware, uh, OK is not only an award-winning uh, debut novelist, uh, he's also an English teacher, so he is very busy. So we are very lucky that we've managed to get this hour with him today in conversation. And we're going to be uh, having a reading from his, his novel, and then we're going to open it into a discussion, particularly talking about some of how OK's work uh, and his writing connects to Pride basically. So without further ado, okay, why don't you take us through a little snippet of your novel? Thank you so much. So I'm going to read to you from a little section in the novel, which is um, towards the towards the middle. Um, the novel revolves around Nena, who is a 16-year-old girl living in Manchester with her mum, who is white. But Nena is half Nigerian. But the problem is she's never met her dad and Nana's mother refuses to discuss her father. So Nana really has no direct connection to her Nigerian heritage or to any part of that sort of side of her family. And the novel follows their journeys towards understanding themselves and each other while also following their friends and lovers and there's a whole sort of cast of characters surrounding them. Um, Nena's father called Morris is someone who met her mother at university and we sort of meet him in flashbacks. So I'm going to read to you a little section towards um, the middle about um, just a moment between Nena and her mother where we find the two of them experiencing love in quite a quiet way. As Joni waited in the freezing cold car for Nana to come out of the takeaway, where she worked, she replayed in her mind bits of her early relationship with Morris. Was she foolish? It had never been a joke to her, however wild it seemed now, for her to have had a child at 21. But the way things had turned out, she felt judged by her circumstances. She felt that her hopes, if not her entire self, had been made a joke of. Joni shook her head as if to clear her mind of a silly thought. She saw a figure walk, direct, walk quickly out of the takeaway and look around. Yes, it was Nena. Joni flashed her headlights and waved out of the window, and Nena trotted across the road. Nena had her music in her ears at full volume. It was the Smiths, and she congratulated herself once again on the aptness of the music. She had appropriated the Meters Murder album as the soundtrack to her life, this charming man was catchier, but her mother had said that she liked it. And Nena told herself, although not in so many words, that it was made for her. She listened to it on repeat. Sometimes when she was walking alone, she pretended she was in a gritty, low budget movie about her life and that the music was underscoring her every move while an invisible audience watched, awestruck by her beauty and sheer significance. Although these things were worn so lightly, so carelessly, that you probably wouldn't notice them if someone hadn't made a film about her and underscored it with the Smiths. Joni quickly wound up the window and commanded her face to betray no reaction to the smell. Nena had worked at the takeaway part-time for most of the summer and Joni was starting to get good at pretending. She held her facial expression fast and tried to busy herself with minutiae about the car to give the impression that she had other things on her mind. Before, air fresheners used to hang in thick, accusatory bunches on the rearview mirror while Joni made tiny, explosive comments about the smell and suggested that Nana's personal hygiene might be partly to blame. Joni tried to ignore it now. Even as autumn was rolling in, even when, as now, it was very cold, she wound down her windows as far as they would go, which varied according to the car's mood, until she saw Nana coming out of the building. She wound up the windows when Nana arrived because not to do so would hurt Nana's feelings, but she convinced herself that the smell wasn't as bad if she'd given the car a good airing first. For her part, 
Nena only plonked herself down on the back seat of the car and said, thanks, with her headphones still in. For picking her up, Joni was never, ever late, and for not wanting to hurt her feelings, which were always out in the open. Nena knew why the car was cold. Love can be such a tiny thing. Neither of them even noticed it as they sat silently in the car, smelling of unholy meats and vowing to have a wash, a really good scrub at home. Thank you. Thank you so much, OK. I, I know for myself, having read your novel, I was deeply touched by the, the complexities of these characters, particularly when it comes to something like love. You know, here we are, it's Pride Month, uh, you know, and we've been thinking about what it means to love, uh, especially when we're talking about our identities. You know, we carry often shame, uh, disgust, but joy and pleasure, often all at the same time. It's, it's who we are. I remember with the passage you just read, it's quite wonderful that you begin with how Nena talks and constructs her own sort of movie in some ways. You know, she is the star of her life. And I know for myself, <laughs> I did that when I was a kid as well. I just imagined what it would be like to live this kind of fabulous life because in so many ways it was a beautiful escape. And, and it's quite timely. You know, many of us are in homes right now. Uh, a lot of us aren't able to socialise and connect. And particularly we know that a lot of LGBTIQ people are in homes where they can't be who they are. You know, they're facing discrimination, abuse. Uh, they have to effectively closet themselves in particular ways. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why Nena represents this kind of depth and why she's important in telling us a story about love, and especially, and in some ways, maybe you could talk about how Nena came to you um, and, you know, in terms of her, her genesis. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to start by saying congratulations on leaving behind that sort of childhood state in your life where you, you know, imagine that if you're listening to music, it's actually the underscore to a film, because I still do that today. If I know, if I walk down to the and I'm listening to a song, I will be doing that. So congratulations on being more mature than me in many ways. Um, and yeah, it's, um, Nana is, so Nana, the story came to me in several stages. This book took something like eight years to write. Um, there were, you know, there were times when I couldn't write a single word because, as you say, I'm a teacher and, you know, I was just too, too busy, but... Um, yeah, it took me eight years from start to finish. And in that time, there was a lot of redrafting and the story changed massively from start to finish. When I first conceived of Nana's character, she was actually one of only, she's only one of many teenagers that I was interested in writing about as a sort of a social group. And then I found myself zeroing in on her more and more. And as her sort of backstory came to me and the backstories of the characters around her also came to me and I thought, I ended up thinking, this is a story that I want to write about people who are in different ways vulnerable. So mm. Nana is vulnerable because she's young. So Nana is, and Nana is also vulnerable because she is, um, she doesn't have that direct connection to her heritage that I have, which I'm really fortunate to have in some ways. So, you know, Nana's father isn't around to explain things to her, to communicate the language to her. Um, there's a point in the novel where Nana's mother and father meet in the past and her father, Morris, explains his parents told him very clearly that he would have to work twice as hard to get half as much as his white counterparts. But nobody's been able to have that conversation with Nana. And, si and similarly, when Nana's at school, you know, she's very, very good at French. She's a prodigy, really. Um, but her boyfriend, who's a bit thick, um, says to her, you know, I can't believe you speak French so well, but you don't even know your own language. And that really spurs her on but that was a moment that i really wanted to portray that as a moment of quite a lot of pain really because nana she doesn't have any defense for that you know she is in this position where she's dating somebody which uh, somebody who doesn't have her intelligence and her um you just you can't match her intellectually and i was quite interested in that dynamic as well because it's a male female relationship Mm -hmm. um, but who, and who sort of out of that feeling of jealousy, you know, pushes that quite vulnerable button in Nena's personality to make her feel a little bit less than she is. Um, and because of Nena's sort of disconnection there, she's very vulnerable. So I was really interested in that sort of 
I, I, I don't want to describe any of these characters really. I don't think it's fair to describe them as being on the edges of society because I think that's quite extreme for what these characters go through. But, mm. you know, Nena, who doesn't have that connection to her Igbo heritage, her mother, who's been through some very dark stuff in her past, um, Jonathan, um, Nena's mother's friend, who is a black, ma black gay man and who is experiencing terrible things um, mm. in, a, in the queer community. Um, you know, I wanted to write about people who maybe just don't quite have as much of a support network or as much um, as, as strong defenses for the things that come at you if you are a person of colour or female or, you know, you know, all sorts of things. Yeah, and I think that's really significant, right? Because we often talk about vulnerability as something that only certain individuals have, you know, people who are in poverty and destitution or, or people who experience violence and persecution, which is, of course, true. But we are all vulnerable in different ways, you know, as, as human creatures, we're relational, uh, we have vulnerabilities. And what really strikes me in reading uh, the novel was how you were able to bring out the kind of layers of vulnerability that people have and, and the layers of resilience, you know, and they're not oppositional. People like to often position resilience and vulnerability as sort of a binary, you know, you're either resilient or you're vulnerable, but actually it's, it's far more complicated than that and they often entangle together. And especially as we're talking about pride and we're thinking about these issues, particularly around whiteness and racism uh, and belonging, which are really, really timely issues, not only in the UK, of course, but just globally at the moment, we're reckoning with the fact that, you know, certain groups of people are experiencing disproportionate rates of violence, uh, discrimination, deprivation. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how some of the characters in your novels, and I'm thinking here of Jonathan in many ways, who resonated a lot with me, speaks to some of those vulnerabilities. Now, of course, in a very different situation, right, where we're dealing uh, in, in a much more interpersonal romantic context, but how that actually connects to some of these broader issues around race and racism, which I think, you know, we as a queer community really need to be having front and centre in our discussion. And I was wondering how you could talk a bit about those dynamics between, you know, Joni and Nena, of course, but also their relationship to Jonathan and Jonathan's relationship to some of the other characters in the novel. Yeah, that's such a good point you make about the sort of supposed um, binary of victimhood and resilience, because I think that that binary doesn't exist, really. You know, um, I, I know people of colour or queer people who, for whatever reason, don't even want to admit to the depth and the extent of institutional racism or homophobia or misogyny because they're afraid of they don't want to identify as a victim. And, you know, of course, I understand that sentiment because being a victim, I think, obviously has these connotations of, of a long term kind of permanent weakness that is inflicted on, upon you by an external force. Um, but at the same time, I think it's so important to be honest with ourselves and with each other about the things that we face on a daily basis, you know, and for Jonathan, in fact, in this story, without giving too much away, his turning point in the story comes when he has to, he faces up to the fact that certain things are happening to him. He spends quite a lot of the story in denial. Um, and I wanted him in conjunction with other people to find his way out of that. So um, yeah, for me, it was really important to find that that sort of almost um, a kind of a confluence of victimhood and resilience because for Jonathan, you know, for everybody it's different, but for Jonathan, and I think also for me, there is a really strong meeting point of those two things. When you, when you, when you sort of take an honest look at where you are and what's happening to you and you think, okay, this is where I am. This is where things are. Now, what can I do? How can I reach for happiness and move towards a better sort of form of existence? And I wanted this novel also to be a sort of story of the interconnectedness of human experience, you know, um, the characters who the the characters who are struggling are often struggling because they can't communicate or are afraid to communicate certain things. Joni is afraid to talk to Nana about her 
father because she carries a lot of shame and confusion about what happened to her mm. and the trauma that I've her that she hasn't really dealt with. Um, similarly, Nana is afraid to talk to her mother about the fact that she wants to know about her father. Mm. She wants to learn to speak Igbo and she wants to explore and learn about that part of her heritage because she's afraid of hurting her mother. Jonathan is afraid of standing up for himself. And there are all sorts of these sorts of fears that keep people hemmed in. And what I wanted to create, which hopefully I have done, is this idea that we are stronger when we help each other. People of very different experiences and backgrounds can do wonderful things for each other, even if they might not seem to be of the same sort of experience. Yeah, and, and I really want to pick up on this point, uh, particularly around communication, especially given that dialogue is something that a lot of us struggle with, whether it's in the interpersonal context. I know personally, you know, in romantic situations, it's certainly something I struggle with, you know, o emotional uh, openness and, von and exposing oneself. But certainly also in the political scene, we see that as well, where people feel like the disclosure of their vulnerabilities will make them weaker or more susceptible to critique when that's actually not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because, of course, we all have different experiences. We're all positioned differently. And so sometimes what we need to do is be honest and forthright with where we're coming from, where we're positioned, and acknowledge that we have certain, you know, privileges, but also oppressions potentially, and 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 be wary of how they, how they connect together. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you were able to explore those dialogues between characters. And I'm thinking here particularly of um, Joni and Nana, right? A mother-daughter relationship, but also one that is difficult because of the fact that Joni is white and Nana is black, right, mixed. And so how does one have those sorts of conversations, particularly in the current moment where people find it enormously awkward and there is an awkwardness there sometimes when you're talking about race and racism particularly if you're acknowledging that you're not a victim of racism how do you have that conversation so i was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that materializes in your writing and how you came to explore that yeah that's a really interesting idea because um you know the sort of the central idea of having a single parent family in the story and the single mum was you know that came from my own experience my relationship with my mum is very different from Nana's to Joni and Joni's very different from my own mother but I know what it's like to grow up in that sort of family um and at the time when I was growing up there was a huge amount of stigma which I think still exists um for single mothers and single parent families where um you know paradoxically there's a lot of blame I think placed on single women raising children as though you know they that they are at fault for having children and not having a husband in, in that sort of traditional way um and i didn't want to do sort of, sort of um a pr exercise on this because i know it, it's not an easy thing to do to be in a family of that structure but at the same time i wanted to bring across some of the joys and the the strength and the resilience that come out of it but as you say at the same time it is difficult to communicate and what and you know the novel is framed around the fact that neither of them are really able to have this conversation about Nena's father and what happened to him and Nena because she's young she's only about to turn 17 the novel sort of hinges on her 17th birthday and, and the things that come with that but then uh, but her mother because she's afraid and really you know thinking of the dialogues that we have about around these things and also about race um a lot of the time they don't happen is the honest answer to that. They don't really happen. Um, you know, in this book, I, again, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it, but um, in this book, the conversations sort of half happen in a series of times before, and, and, and at the same time, we see this pressure building up because this conversation isn't really happening. Nena tries to broach the subject and her mother gets onto it and then gets really uncomfortable or Nena starts learning Igbo and her mother starts to worry that this means that Nena, that her child who she who has been her life for nearly 17 years will be leaving her and um the you know this conversation almost happens a series of times culminating culminating in something quite explosive and I think that is really typical of how conversations like that happen um on an individual level but also I think also in a in a global way, perhaps, I think that, you know, what we're seeing now with the increased visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement mm -hmm. is in some ways just a more ex more um, explosive or more um, visible, wet, visible form of what has been going on for a long, long time, you know, um, to take the example of Nigeria, which is, you know, the country that my parents were born in, that's my heritage, you know, that 
obviously independence happened in 1960, but that was only the culmination of decades and decades, a long, long time of, of, of resistance in many different forms. Um, and partly that is to do with, you know, the just very obvious, the more obvious sort of signs of colonial oppression and sort of the, the military might there that was um, that suppressed um, the, the people of Nigeria and created that country in the first place when it didn't exist. But also it's to do with actually sort of examples of um, misunderstanding. What was one of the funny, not funny, but one of the interesting things about the history of Nigeria that I've been reading about is that one of the early forms of resistance around, um, in some parts of what is now Nigeria took the form of a very decentralised um, military opposition that the British simply didn't understand because um, Igbo culture, my culture, there is no sort of, it's it functioned traditionally on a very sort of decentralized way. There was no sort of um, single king. There was, um, it was much more decentralized. Um, and this allowed a very different, more innovative perhaps style of resistance, but the British didn't understand that. They thought it was simply disorganization. Um, and. There are lots of different sort of examples of this and the way that that worked, but I think that it's just, uh, maybe it's just how people work. Maybe these conversations need to be built up to for whatever reason in different ways um, until something more, much more permanent or concrete and positive happens that, that endures. Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating point. And, and I want to pick up on this idea of resistance and, and, and kind of history. People look at Black Lives Matter as an explosion, right? Like this sudden global moment. But it's been building and this work, this activism has existed for decades. I mean, you know, we have Angela Davis, for example, an amazing black queer woman who has been, you know, for the last 50 years um, advocating around racial justice, uh, uh, thinking about transforming society in a way that values all lives and doesn't, you know, transact in violence. And, you know, her work is sometimes often ignored or forgotten uh, in this mm -hmm. current moment. We like to think of these things as, as discrete points in history rather than as ongoing movements. And, you know, connecting that as well to Stonewall, you know, we've just had uh, the 51st anniversary of Stonewall over the weekend, um, you know, on the, 20th, <laughs> on the 28th of um, June. And of course, that was, a, that was a resistance, right? And that was led by black trans women, black lesbians, you know, we have Marshall P. Johnson, Stormy DeLavery, um, and other, of course, trans women of colour, gay men, you know, pioneering resistance, but it was a history. And, and we, as queer people, carry that history with us, right? Even in the activisms that we do now. And I was wondering if you could reflect a little bit on your own experience with that, both as a person, of course, but also as a writer, because you're speaking to a, a tradition that has come before you. You know, you have writers that inspire you and you have a particular canon that you're engaging with and certain political commitments you are seeking to engage or, or at least touch upon. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that history of resistance that you carry with you, right? Like both at a personal level and as a writer. Yeah, that is absolutely fascinating. And you're so right. I think that, you know, we, we do carry that history with us consciously or not. And we stand on the shoulders of these giants, you know, these largely trans women of color. So it is incredibly painful, you know, even for me as a cisgendered man to see the way that that history is erased or taken for granted or, you know, really spat upon by some members of the community who don't value trans people who don't protect them, who don't want to understand them. And I think that's so important, you know, in, the way that we as a community function is weakened by the way the history gets erased. Um, it's frustrating. I certainly, you know, to talk about my experience as a writer, I'm constantly learning about the erasure of, you know, black writers, black British writers in the past. You know, it's very frustrating to know that something which seems permanent, which you can hold in your hand, can be forgotten very easily. Hopefully, right now we are in a moment of increased awareness and increased, you know, um, learning about the, our histories and about our past. Um, as you'll know, why I'm no longer talking to white people about racism. Yeah. I'm not sure if it still is a bestseller, but it certainly was very, very recently, um, which makes history. Um, but at the same time, underneath that history, 
as Rini Ida Lodge herself would say, she is standing on the shoulders of giants who've come before her. Um, so hopefully at the moment we're moving into something more positive, but maybe it's too soon to tell. Yeah, and, and I also want to think a little bit more about how we talk about these issues more broadly, right? Because, of course, the erasure of history is something that has been very topical of late, um, often in conservative circles as well. You know, we're seeing um, monuments of uh, dead uh, slave-owning colonialists uh, being torn down. And, of course, we're also hearing this narrative that that is the erasure of history. Now, of course, that, that conveniently forgets that, you know, during post-colonisation, uh, the British government destroyed many records of its atrocities in various um, countries that it colonised. Uh, and yet here we see that memorials uh, that are being taken down being referred to as, if you like, the erasure of history. And yet, of course, <laughs> most people are only learning about these individuals precisely because of the fact that people are wanting to take down their memorials. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that erasure how we respond to some of these sorts of conversations of erasure and history, because of course we have different histories. You know, there are multiple histories. There's no single event, as we know. It's a, it's a, it's about meaning making. So I was wondering if you talk about how that matters to you, but also how we kind of engage with this current political moment to ensure that we're bringing to the fore those voices, as you rightly mentioned, those black voices in particular, that have been erased historically. Because of course, people like to throw around the, this idea that, you know, well, we shouldn't judge people by the standards of the past, or, you know, <laughs> yes, they did that, or they did think that, but that was widely acceptable. Because that conveniently erased the fact that so many people were resisting that very idea at that time. So I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about that and how that kind of impacts on you, but also in the context of what you write. Oh my goodness, where to begin? That's such a huge topic. I mean, you're 100% right. So that one of the things that I find most frustrating about this discussion of the so-called erasure of history by throwing a statue of a dead slave owner into a river is this failure to distinguish between history and glorification. You know, as you mentioned yourself, many people did not know who Edward Coulson was until his statue was taken down. So this idea that his statue served to educate people effectively about the about Britain's slave, uh, you know, the, Brit the slavery in Britain's past is completely false. And in fact, um, as, as well as, you know, the deliberate erasure of the British government that you mentioned, of course, we have a much more long term um, sort of current issue of the way that in schools, this history simply isn't taught. And what is interesting, of course, is that the, the same voices who um, you know, decry the destruction of these statues are completely silent on our essentially inadequate history syllabus. We are sending generations after generations into the world without a real knowledge of some of the most important elements of Britain's past. You know, I, like many people, learned about, you know, Hitler and the Henrys um, and, you know, I had to do all of my other education for myself, but what if I hadn't had to do that? What if I was somebody like Nana who didn't have people who could point me in the direction of things? What if I didn't have a focal point for me to begin with my Nigerian heritage? What if I didn't have that? And I think that we need to think about how we are serving ourselves. It, bizarrely, these arguments that are, <clears throat> you know, are trotted out in favour of um, protecting statues of slave owners about those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it, et cetera, et cetera would be very well used in terms of, uh, in a different way, in terms of sort of getting, teaching um, ourselves and our children about the real nature of Britain's past. Um, so that is something that's deeply frustrating to me um, because there is so, it's so different. To, there's such a big difference between education and exposure. There's such a big difference between education and glorification. And as you, and you know, you're 100% right when you talk about the fact that you know, we, there's this um, sort of argument flying around now, as I'm sure it has been for a long time, that we shouldn't judge people in the past by today's standards, which on the one hand seems, you know, on the, on the very surface might seem like a, a more, like, like a perfectly valid argument, but in fact is not at all. You know, as you say, the British government encountered resistance in all sorts of forms in its colonial efforts. Um, and at the same time, the British government also knew that it was, you know, these these pe there were pe the people in power. Certainly, again, I can re refer to Nigeria's heritage with most sort of certainty and sort of knowledge. But 
the the forces at play knew exactly what they were doing, and they knew that you know you know partly because you know, one of the things I find most frustrating is that um, certainly in Nigeria again um, the colonial effort was touting itself as a moral one in lots of ways. You know, what Woodward Kipling refers to as the white man's burden to travel around the world with the Bible and some soap and sort of <laughs> educate and lift dark peoples out of poverty. Yeah, and out of, say um, that. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That white savior on this global military scale um, yeah. is thought of as, pe the, um, you know, people are very quick to dismiss that as, oh, that's what happened yesteryear. But actually, as several quite high profile things have revealed um, recently, I can't remember the name of the journalist now. I wish I could remember her name. Maybe it's best that I don't name her actually so she doesn't come after me. But um, the journalist who was recently um, criticized for going to an African country and taking photos of children in the way that she certainly would have done if she'd been in the UK and um, you know captioning them um, obsessed in that way as they were a commodity, you know, that clearly that sort of um, white saviorism, which we are so quick to dismiss as the values of yesteryear, is still very much alive and well. So this idea that we have moved on is actually really harmful and really toxic. And just, I suppose, one last thing about this idea of education is, like you, I'm sure I've seen clips of um, somebody like Bernadine Avaristo or Afua Hirsch, who will go on television and debate people with what I would consider to be really quite racist views. Um, although, of course, you know, that's a bad word. You can say dirty words, you can't say it. But um, people who I would consider, frankly, to be racist, the level of intelligence and the level of, um, you know, the level of um, education that you need to be able to roundly and robustly combat that kind of ignorance is huge. There's a, there's a, I, what I've noticed is this really unfair imbalance. If you want to go on television or radio and say something that is stupid and racist and just wrong in ahistorical, uneducated, you're given almost a free pass to do that. Whereas if you want to, whereas in order, in order to counter that, in order to um, correct that, you need to really know your stuff. Some of these arguments, some of these quite racist arguments about history and about um, Britain's past in particular, <clears throat> as stupid and as flawed as they are, you need quite a lot of intelligence and a lot of facts to have to be able to unpick them and explain why they're wrong. So this um, sort of um, lack of education that we have nationally isn't just more isn't just a moral problem it's a practical one if we can't unpick these things because of our because of our sort of national ignorance that poses us with a real problem with the way that our culture proceeds into the future yeah and there's there's so much there that you know we could spend hours talking about but i just want to extract this white savior complex because it really speaks to some of the current conversations we're having you know at amnesty international you know the work that we do of course uh, particularly in you know post colonial nations because we recognize that activism is also complicit in in histories of colonialism uh, and and white supremacy and so we need to be able to think through how that complicity functions you know we know that there there are still about 70 countries around the world that criminalize homosexuality, many of those countries having drawn their criminal laws from, for example, British colonialism, uh, you know, and, and have still retained those, those criminal penalties. So, you know, even then connecting it back into your novel in some ways, we also know that you have Nena, who has got this transnational history in many ways that she carries with her uh, to her Nigerian heritage, but growing up in Manchester, her mother is white. And so, you know, she has to also navigate some of these, these, these conversations. And so I want to ask you, I guess, a little bit more about how you see us uh, dealing with those com complicities and complexities, of course, because we're all complicit in racism and white supremacy in some ways. And we often do often gravitate to this kind of saviorist complex, you know, well, I can solve Nena's problem, right? Um, and I think for me, one thing that really strikes me as uh, really um, productive in your novel is that you don't allow for that really easy resolution right it's not about romanticizing Joni's ability to save Nena or give her the knowledge that she needs because of course that's impossible for Joni to do <laughs> but it's 
it's more about how we have some of these difficult conversations in a way that recognizes our own privileges, but our own complicities in the very structures of discrimination that we're seeking to dismantle. And I know as, you know, activists, you know, in the Rainbow Network, for example, we're often trying to, to reckon with this as well. You know, how do we lobby, you know, in other countries um, alongside other activists to challenge criminal laws that punish and police people based on their sexual orientation and gender identity? But also how do we reckon with that both domestically, locally, and globally as well. I know that's quite a large question, but, you know, <laughs> you might have a few thoughts that you would like to share on that. So many thoughts, my goodness, where do I begin? So, I mean, to take it back to, um, goodness me, where do, I, where do I even begin? I mean, to take it back to this question of um, Nana and her journey towards self-understanding, which is at the heart of the novel, the, I think you're absolutely right to zero in on the fact that there is no sort of saviour figure there for Nana. Nobody picks her up and lifts her out of this difficult situation. She's put in a difficult situation <clears throat> by things for which she is not responsible. You know, her mother's shame and problems with her mother's past that um, Nana is not responsible for. And to a certain extent, Joni is also not responsible for either. Um, but mm -hmm. I really wanted to get across the fact that this is not a story about somebody giving Nana something. Mm -hmm. This is not the story, this is not a story of a young, you know, black, um, half Nigerian mixed race teenager of, of sort of getting something from somebody more powerful than her. It's about her fighting to become somebody who is happier and more whole um, and who understands herself better. I was really, really passionate about that. So as much as I wanted it to be a story in which people help each other and Joni and Jonathan, uh, Nana and Jonathan rather, help each other in a really important way, I also wanted it to be a story in which Nana journeys towards becoming a different person rather than necessarily getting something um, and certainly not being given something. One of the interesting dynamics in the novel is that Nana's relationship with her mother is for quite complex reasons, one of the things that holds her back, just as much as it spurs her forward. Her mother is very proud of her and protective of her, um, but when Nana announces a desire to study abroad, um, uh, you know, she's coming to the age where, you know, she's about to turn 17, these things are really on her mind, now what she's going to do after she leaves school. Um, when Nana announces this desire to study abroad, that really, um, launches some really serious tensions between her and her mother in a way that haven't really existed before. They've always had this very close, tender relationship full of warmth and humour. But when Nana, Nana desires more independence, that really starts to um, make their relationship quite tense. And I think in a way that's quite analogous of um, a broader relationship perhaps between um, the... Um, in, in terms of race in the wider world, I don't think the parent-child relationship really carries in that analogy. But I think in terms of, um, you know, to, to, to think, to, to um, refer perhaps to some arguments now about what the Black Lives Matter movement is asking for or demanding in terms of the equalities that we're looking for um, and the justice that we're looking for, um, you know, it's seen as a threat so often. Mm -hmm. um, perfectly rational just things are seen as a threat and, and to refer to more um, individual um, examples of this sort of thing. Um, black people um, are seen as threats in very ordinary context, working context, interpersonal context, romantic or sexual context were seen as a threat um, purely because we are black and that's something that Nana experiences in terms of people sort of um, animalizing her when they when they imagine her having sex the way that her friends talk about her briefly in the novel yeah. um, and it's something I think a lot of black people have experienced as well we are seen as um, threatening um, and um, one of the things that I know that I've talked about with my black male friends is this idea that you have to sort of manage your manage your black masculinity in order to make people feel safe. But we've sort of gone off the topic there, sort of white supremacy and sort of the white savior, is it? Um, so no, have I sort of feared? No, no, I think that's, that's perfectly apt. I mean, especially that last point, you, you know, you really touch on the fact that that managing that we do about, I mean, of course, I can't speak from, uh, from the perspective of being black, but certainly as a brown, queer, queer man, you know, having to manage my brownness in some ways. I mean, these are implicated within structures of whiteness, right? Like, you know, we have to make ourselves seem palatable or desirable. I mean, you know, uh, I can just think about the time when I, you know, first downloaded Grindr. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Grindr is a is a is an app, a dating hookup app for for you know uh, people who are interested in having sex with men. And 
one thing that strike, strikes me at the time was how I presented myself in a way that was quote unquote close to whiteness. You know, I would wear a certain outfit. I would try and emphasize my ability to speak English well and try and dis assert dis distance myself from those stigmas of being too curry or too brown. Um, and, and, you know, often people would refer to me as a coconut, uh, you know, brown on the outside, white on the inside. And I would take that as, as a compliment, right? And these struggles for our own sense of who we are are quite universal in many ways, right? How do we make ourselves palatable to each other? Um, and what do we sacrifice in that process? Which I think is a really, really important point as queer people, but especially, you know, as black, indigenous, queer people of color, how we have to do that on a constant basis, which really is kind of exhausting. You know, um, Toni Morrison yeah. talked a lot about how racism is functions as a distraction. You know, we constantly are exhausted and worn down by it. Um, but we also need to be able to have our differences in order to flourish as human beings. And I, I wanted to, yeah. to bring this up, of course, because, you know, Bernadine Evaristo was writing recently about diversity in the publishing industry and speaking about how when we think about universal experiences and who gets to have, you know, a universal experience, it's always a typically middle class white person who is defaulted to, who is presumably heterosexual. And of course, that erases so many of our experiences, but it also means that when we do tell our stories, we're always pigeonholed. We're the niche person, right? Like how often how we called upon to give testimony as to our brownness or blackness, our queerness, our gayness, only for the moment of, you know, an event or a panel even potentially, you know, and we're never seen as speaking beyond our own audiences. <laughs> But of course, that's not what, what we should be striving for. I mean, you know, when we think about pride and we, when we think about people, you know, who have come before us, you know, I think of Audre Lorde who wrote a lot about the importance of valuing differences as that which energizes us and makes us human, but also about connecting between differences as well. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you try to do that in your novel and also how you speak back to some of these assumptions that are being made in a typically white straight male dominated publishing industry my goodness yeah i mean again fantastic question queen b um bernadine everisto 100 percent right yeah. in terms of the way yeah. that publishing works um i've only i've been i've only had this book out for sort of about eight months now but i um i also have worked in publishing um and you know the things that i've observed over the years um of being um uh just a person who reads worry me i think that the the publishing industry does have a lot to answer for in terms of the way certain stories are privileged over others in terms of the way that black writers and queer writers and other marginalized voices are published or, or not um it's another really complicated question chino achebe referred to the burden of representation this idea that one person or one voice um, is given the responsibility of representing everybody. And of course, as you say, that pigeonholes you. That means that you are you, you, you either feel that you have to cater for everybody or you are told that your single in single sort of um, experience does represent everybody's. And neither of those things can work. Neither of those things is true. So really, for me to write this book about one teenager who is half Nigerian, one white single mother, one gay black man, who's had you know ex negative experiences with religion i really had to break away from any idea that i was speaking for anybody other than myself mm. that i was writing any other mm. stories than these because that's all you can ever really do so and one of the interesting patterns that has come out of the discussions around publishing right now is the idea that as black writers even if our voices are desired more in a way that almost mirrors what you find in the dating and in the dating scene, we are wanted for one thing. We are, you know, it is decided external to ourselves what we bring of value to the table. You know, the dating scene that is hyper masculinity for black men. Um, and in publishing, it's writing about racism in a way that educates white writers. And it's not that there aren't fantastic, there's not fantastic writing that does that. You know, I'm a huge fan of people like Audre Lorde, of, uh, of um, and yet a lodge, but at the same time, writers need to be given that freedom to do all sorts of things. You know, only then can we see ourselves flourish as we really need to. And one of the great things about being on my imprint dialogue books is that I 
I'm given that freedom and that understanding. I've never had any kind of direction about what to write about, or um, I've never had, I've never been told, you know, you have to write about black people in this way. I'm given that freedom to set, tell these stories that maybe wouldn't make it out into the world otherwise. And it's so important to do that and to recognize that we are all better off. We are all richer and enriched with that freedom. Yeah, and I think that speaks to this notion of, of, of what pride represents for so many people, which is the capacity to flourish as who you are. You know, we're constantly having to face the scrutiny of our identities in public, you know, the history of, you know, are we gay enough? Are we black enough? Are we trans enough? Are we queer enough? But not only that, but if we're too queer, then we suffer the burden of, you know, not being palatable to a broader audience. You know, no one's going to read yeah. this. You're not going to get legal rights if you throw your sexuality in people's faces. You're not going to, yeah. you know, click anywhere if you keep flaunting yourself like that. But we're mm-hmm. also then pigeonholed in, in other ways, you know, in terms of in queer spaces, for example, of how we're often asked, well, how can you be religious and gay, right? Like, how can you have these seemingly, to some, conflicting identities? But as we, as you were just talking about, you know, we are layered people, and the point is our differences are sometimes in tension, and that's actually a productive part of who we are, right? It's not something we need to silo or silence, but we actually have mm-hmm. to engage with. And certainly, you know, as we're, we're having this conversation during Pride and, and we're seeking to, to develop these conversations a little bit further, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, you know, in, in terms of whether it's your own experiences. I mean, you spoke about your experience in publishing, which is obviously great, but even just in your own life about how you manage to deal with some of these tensions and scrutinies. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, Parts of Jonathan are based on me um, because I've had negative experiences in the queer community, just like more or less every black man has, but also parts of Jonathan's experience are. So what uh, what was my experience is growing up in the church. Um, I didn't go to the kind of church that Jonathan went to. I wasn't part of an evangelical sort of um, denomination, but it affected me in a similar way in that it, it, it um, colours the way that I think and it provides a basis for me to on which I see the world and it provides a language in which I see the world that still affects me to this day even though I I have no faith anymore I don't believe in any god um so for Jonathan what I wanted to convey is that sort of same thing I didn't want to provide any kind of definitive answer on whether you can have faith and be queer I just I didn't want Jonathan to visibly give up either one um but at the same time when Jonathan's story is sort of rounded off in a way that I won't reveal the way that that happens is articulated through the language of religion. And I wanted that to be something that empowers him in a way that gives him the right to decide. So often when we have these these discussions about people whose identities um, are seemingly in tension, as you say, you know, you're absolutely right. These um, the, the, the answers to those tensions, if you like, are forced upon these people externally. You know, how can you be queer and Muslim, for example, or, um, and, all, the, all these people are simply erased. So obviously with the no outsiders um, sort of mm-hmm. controversy that um, exploded in this country, what seems like a thousand years ago before lockdown but actually was not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Um, this, the discussion was very much Muslims versus queer people. And there were surprisingly few people who understood the intersection that can exist there and, and that does exist there. This idea that we have to either consider the, the, um, the views of, of Muslims, which again, as is typical of racism, um, homogenizes Muslims and, and assumes all Muslims to be um, monolithic um, versus the views of queer people who, um, and, and of course, in, involved in that debate was a, this whole um, sort of faux saviorism to protect, seemingly to protect queer people from the nasty Muslims when take away the opportunity to be Islamophobic and all of that desire to protect queer people evaporates. So there's a lot of quite toxic stuff in that debate that I think needs to be dealt with. What I wanted to do in my writing was simply to give my character the freedom to make his own choice um, and to hold on to parts of himself that he wanted to and to let go of what was holding him back. I mean, I think that's really beautiful and and I know we're almost out of time now. So I just wanted to really emphasize that last point because I think it's so poetic and it speaks to so many of us is that hold on to who you are. 
I mean, largely, you know, that is what we fight for when we talk about pride and when we talk about what we want to achieve in the world is to just hold on to those things that make us who we are and allow that to flourish freely, of course, but on our own terms, not on the terms that are dictated by oppressive institutions or social norms, but, you know, from who we are and how we relate to the communities that we're a part of. And and that's so important. Now, before we we wrap up, I just wanted to um, ask you what you're working on now, if you could hint at anything exciting (laughs) that we might look forward to in the future from you. Yeah, thank you. There's some really exciting stuff happening. So um, my contract is for two books. So I'm writing my second one now, which will be out in April 20, uh, in spring 2022, which um, is really exciting. I'm writing a story which is not a sequel to The Private George and Nana Maloney, but which is um, continuing the themes of um, how much we all need each other, of people who might not seem like they are obviously connected, um, being connected in ways that are complex and often really, really positive and necessary. Um, and I'm really excited to continue that story. I'm really excited. And I can I can tell you that I am very excited to be able to read that story uh, very soon. I mean, you know, it was an absolute pleasure to read The Private Joys of Nena Maloney. And I would encourage you all, uh, we'll post a link, uh, I would encourage you all to, to purchase a copy of this book or, or find it in your in your library. You know, it's published by Dialogue Books, uh, which is a great, um, you know, imprint that really focuses on, as Oki was talking about earlier, marginalised voices. And it's so important in as we think about pride and we think about our different communities to be able to highlight those voices. And for those of you who are really keen to get more involved in, you know, activism, hopefully this conversation has energised you and, and, and made you want to get more involved, please sign up to the Amnesty UK Rainbow Network Work. There's a link uh, as well. Um, we're often doing all kinds of work, working on issues for people seeking asylum. We're, we're dealing with issues of racism. We're, we're also working on trans rights, intersex rights, dealing with um, religious minorities as well. So, you know, we have a broad range of, of campaigns we're working on. So I would encourage you all to sign up, get involved and happy Pride, everyone. Thank you. And thank you. Okay. Thank you.